Let's suppose that you're an epidemiologist looking at a population of humans that you're investigating, or you're a clinician and a patient walks into your office, or you're a researcher in a lab looking at a sample of human tissue. It helps to pose the question, what is this patient that I'm looking at? How did it get there? Why is it the way it is? We're going to look now at a series of different ways of answering the question, what is a patient? And the first way we're going to look at it is by noting that they have an ancient history. There are ancient events that have had important medical consequences. Some of them occurred really a very long time ago. By the way, you have to be careful when an evolutionary biologist talks about time. I might say, oh, that happened relatively recently, and I might mean, well, only 10,000 years ago. That's because we conceptualize stuff like the asymmetric division of bacterial cells. That originated more than 3 billion years ago, and it created the conditions for the evolution of aging, and probably for the maintenance of the germline up to the present. We will study that issue in detail when we go into the evolution of aging. Stem cells originated when multicellularity originated. So multicellular organisms uh, evolved about one to two billion years ago. And they are pre-adapted, stem cells, not multicellular organisms, are pre-adapted to become cancer cells. Retrovirus insertion into a proto-immunoglobulin gene happened about 500 million years ago. And that started the evolution of the vertebrate adaptive immune system, which protects us so admirably from infectious disease and most of the time from cancer. Highly invasive placentas evolved in the shared ancestor of orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans about 15 million years ago. And they are associated with preeclampsia, that is highly dangerous uh, maternal blood pressure during pregnancy. So these examples are arranged more or less from the very old to the reasonably old. And it's important to realize that something which has been around for that long is going to be very hard to change. So let's start to take these apart. We're going to go into each of these in more detail when we are talking about aging, cancer, adaptive immunity, and parent-offspring conflicts over parental investment. The first one, this very ancient one, three billion years old, is asymmetric division. The idea here is that when one cell divides, this is a bacterial cell, it's dividing asexually, one daughter gets newer parts and the other gets older parts. So we can identify a difference between a daughter who is younger and a mother who is older. The cell lineage with older parts will die out sooner and the cell lineage with newer parts will live longer. This has been confirmed in Escherichia coli, the gut bacterium, and it can actually explain the survival of the germline since the origin of life. Basically, we are the descendants of all of the cells that had younger parts over th three billion years. If division were perfectly symmetrical, then there wouldn't be any way of distinguishing between a mother and a daughter's cell. Both of them would have equal probabilities of survival. Both of them would then be equally intact or equally damaged, and the reproductive payoff from improving the maintenance of both would be equal. So they would be invested in equally. And that would mean that investment would be high in both, and this would be a situation in which we would not expect aging to evolve. However, as soon as the reproductive payoff of maintaining the mother's cell becomes smaller. So the mother's reproduced, the daughter has not yet started, the mother is more likely to die, the daughter has younger parts and is in better shape and is therefore more likely to survive and reproduce, then aging will evolve in the mother's cell as a cost of that reproductive performance. So this is uh, an inference about the division of E. coli. The old poles of the cell are in red, the new poles are in blue, and the point of the diagram is to show that you can trace through the process of division which cell got the new pole and which cell got the old pole. 
And of course, in the next round of division, then there's a redefinition of what is the old pole and the new pole, but you can follow cell lines that go new, 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 and that go old, 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 and see how long they live. And when that is done, that's going on here. So here is the original cell that divided into two. That's the new pole. That's the old pole. It, this one divided into two. That's the new pole and the old pole. This one is new, 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 new. And this is how long they lived. And you can see that that one that was new all the way through lived the longest by comparison with the other daughter cells. So if you look through a series of consecutive old new pole divisions, and you look at the growth rate of those daughters, the ones that got the new poles are increasing over the average, and the one that got the old poles are decreasing. So the conclusion from this is that the ones with the old poles are senescing. They're not performing as well. They're not producing as many daughters. They are dying younger. It's taking them longer to produce the next daughter cell. The ones that get the new poles will outcompete the ones that get the, no, the old poles. Now, the next example has to do with pre-adaptation to cancer or ex-adaptation to cancer. And it results, uh, this insight results from the recognition that stem cells are really a great innovation in multicellularity, but they have characteristics that predispose them to cancer. So stem cells, which are used to renew and repair damaged tissue, retain the potential to differentiate and the ability to move. And that, those characteristics pre-adapt them to a cancerous lifestyle. There's stem cells all over our bodies and they are positioned to replace cells that wear out and are discarded. So we have them particularly in bone marrow, where we're making a lot of blood cells, in our lung, in the lung epithelium, in the intestine, in the intestinal epithelium, which is continually shedding cells, and in our skin, which is continually exfoliating. So these are the tissues in which malignant cancer is frequent. Leukemia, lung cancer, colon cancer, melanoma. That's where we find the most cancer. We find the most cancer where stem cells are being used the most frequently to repair and renew tissue. The next example of something that happened a long time ago that has medical consequences is the origin of adaptive immunity. That's at about 500 million years. So the adaptive immune system originated between the agnathans, so these are the lampreys, and the cephalochordates, so this would be the lancet, amphioxus. If we look at these living examples here, we do not find vertebrate adaptive immunity, and if we look down here, we find, uh, if we look above here, we find vertebrate adaptive immunity, and if we look below that, we don't find it. So something happened right there. What was it? By the way, before I go on to the vertebrate case, all of these invertebrates have quite functional immune systems. They just don't have the special kind of somatic recombination that we have that generates our antibodies. What happened 500 million years ago is that a transposon, a jumping gene, which was derived from a virus, inserted itself into our DNA and it brought with it the machinery that allows our lymphocytes to generate diverse antigen receptors to recognize and to repel anti uh, pathogens that are invading. If we break that down a little bit, we can imagine that 500 million years ago, there was a circular piece of DNA. It was carrying a transposase gene, okay? So this would be a gene which is good at cutting DNA in two and inserting itself and it actually inserted into a receptor gene which was at that time the precursor of our immunoglobulins. It cleaved the DNA, it inserted the transposon, and then subsequent evolution actually took parts of this system and it put the receptor genes on one chromosome and it put the transposase genes on another chromosome. And these are now the enzymes that run the process of somatic recombination and they work 
on the receptor genes, now on a different chromosome, so that they can cleave them and then they can be recombined in the cell in different combinations to form immunoglobulins. So there's an event. It's 500 million years old, and it took a chunk of machinery, essentially derived from a virus, built it into our genome, and allowed us to, as vertebrates, carry out somatic recombination. And that is what generates the huge antibody diversity that means that we have the capacity in our bodies to deal with completely uh, new and previously unrecognized pathogens. The pathogens can be evolving rapidly and mutating, and we will be recombining genes in our bodies in many different combinations to meet that threat. More recently, about, remember recent, right, 15 million years ago, the especially highly invasive placenta of the great apes evolved. And we can recognize that by comparing, this is now tree thinking, okay, we can compare on our evolutionary tree with our relatives, chimpanzee, gorilla, orangutan, and gibbon. We have good evidence on gibbons. We don't have such good evidence on orangutans, but we have good evidence on humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas. Human placenta is discoid, villus. It has deep invasion of the uh, arteries in the endometrium, and then it remodels the spiral arteries extensively. It, this does not happen to anything like that extent in gibbons. So we have trophoblast invasion, spiral artery remodeling, and this happened about 15 million years ago in the ancestor that we share with chimpanzees and gorillas. So it happened right there. Now if we look at a cross section of the placenta, we can see the fetal portion of the placenta, which is derived from the chorion here, and it extends into a space that is bathed by maternal blood and there are maternal arterioles here. And the invasion essentially is both the invasion of tissue into this space and also the invasion of stem cells into the maternal arteries. And what that does is it gives the genome of the fetus a bit of control over the diameter of the pipe through which it's being fed. And that is actually a good example of a morphological adaptation representing parent-offspring conflict. So when the fetal stem cell invades the endometrium and inserts itself into the spiral artery, it's taking control over the delivery of food. And it's a way of actually visualizing an important concept in a real structure where this concept is usually expressed in terms of things like parent of origin uh, genetic imprinting. It gives the fetus an advantage early in life. It's going to get a growth advantage. It's going to get more nutrition. It's going to get more food. But it pays later in life by an increased risk of metastatic cancer because the stem cells that can do that, that can move into tissue, insert themselves, and then take some control over it are exactly like the cells in the metastatic cancer that are out in the bloodstream and then perhaps inserting themselves into lung tissue or kidney tissue or liver tissue or something like that. So when we take this historical view and we look at important features of human biology, we can see that metabolism is one and a half to four billion years old that cells, chromosomes, and sex are about one and a half to two and a half billion years old. Multicellularity is about one to one and a half billion years. Our immune system, 500 million. Endothermy and the scrotum, which descends to allow sperm to develop at lower temperature, well, about 230 million years old. Lactation, about 230 million years. The placenta, roughly 190 to 200 million. Highly invasive placentas, about 15 million. Bipedalism, and with it all of the remodeling of the birth canal, started about 7 million years ago. And then the short interbirth interval with sharing of food and child care, sometime in the last 5 million years. And then our hairless, dark skin color and abundant sweat glands, about 2 to 3 million years ago. If 
By the way, that seems to be associated with long distance running, running down gain. If we put this into a tree, here's an example of hominid phylogeny. It starts about seven million years ago and runs up to the present. The names here are uh, Artipithecus, this is Australopithecus, this is Paranthropus, then we have the various hominids. Tools probably originated uh, along this branch of the tree. Homo habilis had tools. Then cooperative hunting and the narrow birth canal are originating in here. And when we get up to this point, we have a number of different, fairly closely related uh, versions of Homo, and they actually hybridized a bit with each other. Uh, Homo floriensis is this sort of hobbit-like creature that lived in the East Indies about, oh, 15, 20,000 years ago. So, Sahel anthropus was probably already bipedal. Australopithecus had a relatively small brain and was probably a fruit eater. Then there are a number, if you look across here, you can see, my goodness, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different hominid species that seem to be existing at the same time. This is probably in uh, eastern and southern Africa. Then Homo erectus here migrates out of Africa, colonizes Asia and Europe well before Homo sapiens evolved. So there was a hominid living in Europe and Asia before our species existed. They had fire, they could cook, they hunted, they scavenged, they had hand axes. So there's good examples of that in Spain 800,000 years ago. Then our ancestors emerged from Africa about 100,000 years ago. They paused in the Middle East around uh, Palestine, Syria, uh, Iraq, for about 30 to 50,000 years. Then they spread out into Asia and Europe. In Asia and Europe, our ancestors hybridized with Neanderthals and with the Denisovians, which were another branch of the tree, uh, in East Asia. And there's some evidence that we hybridized with unknown hominids in Africa within the last 100,000 years. So there may be elements of this tree that are missing, but there are genes that can carry that kind of signature present in the genome of modern Africans. So to summarize, Every organism and every trait has a history, and the history makes a difference. Traits have different ages of origin. or That means that organisms are mosaics of parts that have existed for different amounts of time. The older the trait, the harder it probably is to change it. Things that can only evolve slowly constrain things that can evolve rapidly. Some traits of medical significance are millions to billions of years old. 